I'm going to give you some background on static equilibrium first, some extra mathematical knowledge or some physics knowledge that you might need in order to, before we begin talking about it. So <clears throat> last time we talked about torque, how to compute torque, how to evaluate torque in various situations and so on. But there's a little bit more to, to uh, go over. Oh, God, it feels like I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> there's a little bit more to go over that will make your life a little bit easier when, when trying to handle torque in specific, like, problems or scenarios. So let's talk about using a particular type of geometry to determine torque. So just as a rem reminder, um, the magnitude of the torque, which is a vector, remember, this is the magnitude of R cross F, R cross F being how torque is defined. And so the magnitude of a cross product is just equal to the magnitude of the product of the, or sorry, is equal to the product of the magnitudes times the sine of the angle between the two vectors, right? That's just a thing that is true about cross products we covered at the beginning of the quarter. Sometimes we can figure out, um, we can easily, or relatively easily, um, determine either R sine theta or uh, F sine theta just using geometry. And so the point is, is if you can determine one of those quantities without having to actually find the length of the vector and then compute the angle and then take the sine of that angle, if you can find those quantities just as a single geometric object, then all you have to do is multiply by the magnitude of the other vector and that will give you the torque. Um, so for example, let's say that we have a rod with a pivot, say here, and maybe there's a force F that is applied at some angle theta there. So this distance is D, let's say. Then this vector, this would be our F parallel, and this vector would be our F perp. Now, the magnitude of F perp, we've gone over this before, is equal to the magnitude of F times the sine of the angle. And keep in mind, by the way, that this angle here, this angle, that is the angle between, or at least it's, yeah, it, 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 it is effectively the angle between the vector that points from the pivot to the place where the force is applied and, where the, and, the, and the direction of the force itself. So that, that theta is the theta that we expect. So in this case, the torque, the magnitude of the torque is just FD or F, F perp times D, which is equal to F sine theta times D. So in this case, where you just know where, where this distance is known, it's just a known thing, it's relatively straightforward to find F perp just by using a little bit of trig. Alternatively, in the same setup, we could have done it a different way. And by the way, the second method we'll be using a little bit more frequently. So again, this distance is D. We have our force vector F here. This angle is theta. So <clears throat> the other method is that we draw something called an extended force line. So you basically just extend the, the force vector. You, you know, often you'll use dotted lines or whatever. You extend the force vector in both directions and then you find the line that connects the pivot point to that extended force vector or that extended force line at a right angle. And when you do that, or the reason why you might want to do that <clears throat> is because that length there is R sine theta. And hopefully you can see from the trigonometry how that works out. <clears throat> um, and so in this case, we would have that the torque, and by the way, these will give the same answers. It's just different ways of calculating it. The torque is equal to, uh, and I'm gonna call this D perp. The torque is equal to F, the magnitude of F times D perp, which is just F times D sine theta. Now this quantity D perp has a name. It's called the moment arm. And basically it's the perpendicular distance between the force vector and the pivot. <clears throat> and that so that particular uh, would we include the size of the rod when calculating R? R is 
R is this vector. R is always the vector from the pivot point to where the force is applied. <clears throat> so if, if you know the moment arm, and sometimes you know the moment arm and you don't know the magnitude of R, like in some specific cases, that's just something that you know, or that's given to you, then it's just easier to find the torque because you just multiply it by the magnitude of the force. Now, <clears throat> I want to, uh, so, so th those are just two useful ways to calculate torque. You can calculate torque however you want, as long as it's mathematically consistent, right? It's just sometimes one, doing one of these two methods is easier. Now, there is a bit that I wanted to talk about. Um, I, I, I kind of have to go on a detour to talk about um, the center of mass of a complicated system. So let's just take a detour to um, more about center of mass. And this is going to be useful because oftentimes these torques care about center of mass. So that's why we might need this. So suppose that there are two objects. And we know the center of mass of each of them individually. The question is, is as a, as a single system, or let me rephrase, combined into a single system, how would we find the center of mass of that larger system? And so one way that we could do it is we could just recalculate the center of mass like we, like we know how to do. You add up all the little bits for one, you add up all the little bits for the other, and then you divide by the total mass and so on. So for example, let's say that we have like a blob here, which has a center of mass, say CM1. And then we have a blob over here, which has a center of mass, say, I'm just going to line them up on the x-axis so that um, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. So where, so the question is, is where is the center of mass? And the, the point is, is we would like to know how to do this without having to recompute the center of mass or without having to know anything about the makeup of these individual bodies, like how the mass is distributed. We know that the center of mass should be like somewhere in the middle, right? But the question is where? So let's look at some definitions. So the x position, the, the x coordinate position, you know, give some coordinate systems, whatever. Of the first center of mass, this is just defined as one over the total mass m1 times an integral of object one times x dm, right? That's just how it's defined. And then similarly, the center of mass location in the, or the center of mass x coordinate for the second object is one over m2 times the integral over object two times x dm, right? That's just how center of mass is defined. Now we know that the total center of mass we could compute is the total mass m1 plus m2 times the integral over both objects, object one plus object two, x dm, right? That's just how we would do it. But the point here is that integrals are splittable, right? If you have an integral from zero to 10, you could split it up into an integral from zero to five plus an integral from five to 10. And so this can be written as one over m1 plus m2 times the integral of object one, x dm, plus the integral of object two, x dm. So all I've done is split the integral, and that's just a thing that in, that integral or that that's a relationship that integrals satisfy. And so we could do a little bit more trickery here. We can multiply and divide this one by m one, multiply and divide the second one by m two, and we would find that we would get one over m one plus m two times m1 xcm1 plus m2 xcm2. Or put another way, it's m1 xcm1 plus m2 xcm2 divided by m1 plus m2. And so the point of this exercise is just to illustrate that for all intents and purposes, not intensive purposes, for all intents and purposes, um, if you know the center of mass of a subsystem of whatever thing you're interested in working with, then you don't have to recalculate all of the components of that subsystem in order to find the new center of mass, because you can treat that subsystem as if all of its mass were concentrated at its center of mass. 
Because if you remember, this is the formula for two point masses of mass m1 and m2. Sorry, this is the formula for the center of mass of two point masses. So like you have one here, one here, where the point masses are located at xcm2 and xcm1. So the, it just behaves, these systems behave as if all of their mass were concentrated at their center of mass. Right, it's precisely the same. So the point is, is if you can calculate the center of mass of each subsystem independently, then you can compute the center of mass of the whole system just by treating them as if they were point masses. And that's a useful thing to be able to do. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's, so we're, the reason why we needed that or why, why that's a useful discussion is because we're, we're about to talk about gravity, which involves the center of mass. So we're go let's go back to uh, some background for static equilibrium. So far, we know how to compute things like torque and things like, um, or, or we know how to compute torque, which is necessary, but in order, which is necessary to do static equilibrium problems. But in order to actually apply what we know to real life things, we need to know what location on a body gravity applies the force. So like if you push on an object, you know where the force is applied. It's, it's applied where you're pushing. And like the normal force, for example, is applied on the bottom of the object. But the question is, is where does gravity act from? Because we'll need to know that information in order to figure out how much torque gravity produces. Now, I said in an earlier lecture that gravity does act from the center of mass, but I, I want to give you an example of, to see that working. So let's, let's work an example here. And this isn't going to be a torque example. This is just going to be an energy example, really. But it will illustrate how the uh, gravitational force only cares about the location of the center of mass. So let's consider the potential energy for a falling. And by the way, this is similar to a homework problem, slash rotating uniform rod. So before, so we have a rod like this, which is in this orientation before, has a pivot here, and then it falls down into the after case. Now, let's compute the initial energy, the final energy, and so on. So the initial potential energy would be given by an integral. So, so how would we find the initial potential energy? Well, first things first, we would have to, typically what we would have to do is we would have to figure out the height of each individual chunk of the, of the rod so that it, we can treat them as point masses, find the height of those, of those uh, chunks, multiply them by mg, and then add, all of, add up all of those chunks. So this would be the, an integral, and I'm gonna use the standard coordinate system Actually, I'm going to use a non-standard coordinate system. I'm going to use a, um, a coordinate system that's like this. So that's x, that's y, and x equals 0 here, and y equals 0 here. So this would be y equals l, and this would be x equals l. This will be, it's just it's just a convenient, cor sorry, it's a convenient coordinate choice. Right, so we break up, we break these up into chunks. And so we would be integrating from x equals zero to x equals l, right? We were adding up a whole bunch of chunks along the x-axis. Each of those chunks would have some mass dm. And then we wanna multiply that mass by mg. Sorry, uh, we wanna multiply that mass by g times the height of that mass. Now, what's the, the height of each mass in this case is constant. So I'm just gonna call it yi, right? It just is constant. And so, in fact, we can just pull it out because it doesn't depend on the position of these masses, right? It doesn't matter which, which chunk of mass you take along the x-axis. The height is doesn't care at all about it. And so this is just an integral of dm, which is just the total mass. So this is just mgyi. And because we chose the initial height to be 0, this is just equal to 0, right? Okay, now what about the after, the, the final potential energy? 
Well, we would do the same thing, except this time we have to change the, or, or the, the, uh, the rod is oriented differently. So we would integrate here from y equals zero to y equals L. We have to add up all the chunks of mass going down the rod, right? And then we have to multiply those chunks. Sorry, we would take each small chunk, multiply it by G times the height of that chunk or the position of, sorry, I need to have YB up. And so this actually needs to be, sorry about that. Otherwise the, the, uh, the potential energy function is different. So this is annoying, but it's so, ah, shouldn't have done, tried to do something fancy. Let's call that YI, let's call this Y equals zero. Uh, so then that's just YI. Okay, now we're good. So, so here I would integrate from Y equals zero to Y equals YI, right? Now that YI in this case would be L, but well, yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. L. Just a, just coordinate choices. I didn't change anything. Sorry about that. Right. So so now we're integrating up this rod, and here we note that each chunk of mass is at a different height. So we multiply by g times y. But importantly, this y depends on which chunk we're looking at. So in particular, this is equal to, and we can uh, do some uh, do some rearranging here. I'm going to multiply and divide by m. So this is equal to mg times one over M and I'm pulling out the G times Y equals zero to Y equals L of Y DM, right? So all I did was I multiplied and divided by M and then I pulled out the G. Now that Y depends on the chunk of mass. So that's why we have to keep it in the integral. It's not constant, but importantly, this term here, that is just the vertical position of the center of mass. Right? That's just the formula that we use for finding the center of mass of an object. And so the potential energy, the final potential energy of the system is just mg times the, center, the final center of the final y position of the center of mass. Now, so what we find here is that the change in gravitational potential energy is just the change in the center of mass. And the reason for that is because this position here, yi, that is the vertical center of mass of the horizontal rod. So this is also equal to ycm i. So this is equal to mg times ycm f minus ycm i, or mg times Delta YCM, i.e., the change in the position of the vertical, the, the change in the vertical coordinate for the center of mass. So the, the point of this exercise is just to illustrate that all of this business about potential energy and indeed it, because potential energy is related to force, force, like gravitational force, all of that business only cares about where the center of mass of the object is. So this leads us to suspect that gravity only cares, like gravity just in general only cares about the location of the center of mass. Which implies then that gravity acts from the center of mass. I.e., if you're looking to figure out where the force of gravity on a free on an extended free body diagram applies, it or it originates from the center of mass and then points downwards. And so this is where the term um, center of gravity comes from. That's why the center of gravity and the center of mass are actually basically the same thing. So with this in mind, with this, with this, and obviously I didn't prove it to you, I just gave some justification for why this should be the case. But with this in mind, that gravity acts from the center of mass, now we have the tools to handle the, uh, the torque that is created by the force of gravity. So with that in mind, now we can actually go and do static equilibrium. So let's talk about static equilibrium in more detail now. So let's break down the words. Static means unmoving. Equilibrium means not about to move. 
So what this implies, what this equilibrium business implies is that the net force is zero. And further, the net torque is zero. Because if either of those things were not true, if the net force wasn't zero or the net torque wasn't, wasn't zero, then either it would start accelerating translationally because the net force wasn't zero, or it would start uh, uh, angularly accelerating because the net torque wasn't zero. And both of those cases do not imply that it's not about to move because either of those are examples of motion. So when we set up a static equilibrium problem, what it boils down to is you write down Newton's laws, both the rotational and translational versions, like f, f net sub x equals max, f net sub y equals may, and uh, net torque equals I alpha. You write those down, you write down what constraints you have, like is, it per is there perfect rolling, is there, or is, is there a uh, rolling without slipping, or is there some sort of friction constraint or whatever? And then you just use those equations and what else do you know about the system to solve? Now, that's all fine and dandy, but it, gets, it can get a little tricky because unlike when you calculate the force on a system, the torque on a system depends on where you choose to compute your pivot point. So let me just write some words. So the torque applied on a system can be evaluated in a lot of in a lot of ways. And it's not like the, the, the torque that you get is the same in all of those different ways. So the question is, is how do you evaluate the torque consistently? Sorry, my nose is so itchy. Um, the reason it can be evaluated in a lot of ways um, is because uh, any location can be where a pivot point is, i.e. Typically, in these types of problems, you're just given a system. You're not told that there is some fixed axis that it's trying to rotate around because the object's not rotating at all. There is no pivot point, so you just have to pick one. So the question is, is which one do you pick? Or where do we put the pivot point? Well, it turns out the answer is, kind of a non-answer. The point is, is you can choose any convenient pivot point to calculate the torque, uh, to calculate the torque around. Um, the reason why you can do this is because assuming the system is in static equilibrium, um, if the torque is zero about one pivot point that, that you chose somewhere, it will be zero about every other pivot point. Basically, think of it this way. If it's not rotating, it doesn't matter which place you think it's rotating about, it will not be rotating about that place. So the torque about any pivot point should be zero as long as it's not actually rotating. Um, so, so, you, so the point is, is you just pick one, pick a place that's convenient to calculate around, and then do it. And as long as you're setting it equal to zero, which is what it means for it to be in equilibrium, then that's a fine choice. Now, there is something to be said that sometimes some choices of pivot point are less convenient than others because it'll make your life more difficult, just calculationally speaking. But it doesn't mean that you're wrong. Now, we talked about the gravitational force, and I kind of brushed the normal force under the rug. But we should talk about where the normal force acts. So let's talk about the normal force just as a quick aside. We know it acts from the bottom or the where the like the contact place, but what if like it's what if like the two things are contacting along the plane, right? So if an object is in static equilibrium, in SE static equilibrium, um, we can use that fact to learn about the forces, or to learn about the system rather. Now, there's a reason why we can do this, and that's because if we know that the net torque is zero about any pivot point, then that means that we can, and we say we know where all of the forces are being applied except one, that restricts where one of the forces has to be applied to. 
So we're going to try to answer this question. So let's say that we have a blob or like a, a lumpy mountain or something has a center of mass here. And so that means that we know that the force of gravity is downwards there, right? That's the, the force of gravity acts downwards from the center of mass. But the question is, is where does the normal force apply? Like it has to, sorry, uh, I froze. Okay. So the point is, is let's say we have a blob the, with a center of mass where I looked, where I indicated it. We know the gravitational force acts from, this, from the uh, center of mass downwards. The question that we want to answer is where does the normal force apply for, or where, where, at what point is the normal force acting? Now, there is something to be said that in fact, the normal force acts at all of those points, just like how the gravitational force actually acts at each of the each infinitesimal chunk of matter and pulls it pulls each one down equally. The normal force acts at every point of contact. However, just like the gravitational force, we can do some calculations and we can do we can try to readjust our understanding so that we can think about where would the normal what what would the where would the effective normal force be if we averaged over all of the all of the locations of where the teensy teensy normal forces are applying like what is the effective location of the normal force um so it turns out that the normal force acts so that it is in a vertical line, at least in this case, with the center of mass. Now, think about this for a moment. Why should that be the case? So in, in fact, it would be like this one. That's the correct one. Why should that be the case? Well, suppose it wasn't. If it wasn't the case, then the r vector, let's say it instead was this one, then the r vector would not be in the same direction or, or rather anti-parallel to the normal force, in which case that force would produce a torque. Whereas the gravitational force, computing the torque about the center of mass, the gravitational force does not produce a torque. And that's because the distance between the gravitational force's application point and the pivot point are zero. It, it is zero. So the, the gravitational force doesn't produce a torque. And so if it was this other normal, if it was this other place that wasn't in line with the center of mass, the torque produced by the normal force would be non-zero and hence the net torque would be non-zero. And thus you would expect that the object would rotate. But we're assuming that the object is in static equilibrium, which means that it can't be rotating. And hence the torque, or, and hence the normal force has to be directly below the center of mass. Otherwise, any non-zero angle between the center of mass and where the, where the normal force is applied will produce a torque. And so this kind of, th this should kind of repeat or kind of uh, agree with your intuition. So let's consider a more complicated case. Let me uh, grab this. What if instead, again, we're going to assume static equilibrium, but instead, instead of just having gravitational force be downward, what if on top of that gravitational force or in addition to it, I just push down on it with my finger over here? If another force is applied, where is the normal force now? So remember that the normal force is there for like way back when we first started talking about it. The normal force is there to be a, oh, I, I froze. Oh boy. Uh, says my internet connection is unstable. Am I good? Well, okay, it's still recording. So I'm going to keep going because you can always, okay, good, I'm back, right? So if another force is applied here, we want to know, does the normal force stay in the same place? Now, think back to when we first started talking about the normal force. We called it like this, uh, like a reaction force or like a, uh, not a reaction force. What was the language that we used? Um, we use the language of a, uh, like a compensating force, right? The normal force was just whatever it needed to be to prevent the object from falling through the ground. Well, the normal force does more than that. We just didn't mention it before. 
The normal force is there as a balancing force to prevent to keep an object in static equilibrium, assuming it's actually in static equilibrium. So if the object is in static equilibrium, the normal force will be both, it will have the magnitude, whatever it needs to be to keep the object from falling through the ground, and it will be applied in the location to keep the object from rotating. Like if I just put my phone on my hand, the object is not rotating, nor is it falling. So the normal force has to be in the place that makes that true. So if I push here, the normal force has to move so that the torque that I'm creating with this, uh, with this apply, extra applied force is no longer or is canceled out by the torque created by the normal force. So it's not, it's not exactly where the normal, where, where the second force is acting. Right. Hannah's right. It'd be, it'd be somewhere between. <clears throat> so it would maybe end up say here, it has to move somewhere between where the gravity is applied and where the thumb is because the gravity, this force will have some torque and the normal force will have some torque, but because you could look at the rotations that they would cause, and they're in, they are, they would produce opposite rotations. And so the normal force, as long as it's not directly underneath the uh, the gravitational force, will produce some torque in the opposite direction. And yeah, I mean, of course, the magnitude of n will change as well, just to make sure that it, the object doesn't fall through the ground, right? But it will move somewhere in between. So the normal force is like we saw before, the normal force is a balancing force, but it balances both the magnitude of the downward force so that to keep the object from falling, and it balances the torque to keep the object from rotating. Now, here's where things get slightly tricky. Let's talk about tipping. Not the thing that you do to a delivery driver, uh, but the thing that you do to a cow. Although I, I understand that that's actually really not good for cows, so don't maybe do that. So tipping, when things tip over, <clears throat> that's a type of rotation. Our intuition shouldn't just be the normal force balance, but rather all forces which act in the opposite direction. Uh, well, see, so the normal force was always there to balance all forces which act in the opposite direction. That's always been the case. Like remember with the the example with the uh, the planks on the uh, like the the wooden planks on the pickup truck. Like in that case, the normal force was not just gravity because there were other forces pushing downwards on the plank. So the normal force had to cancel that out too. So let's slightly change the scenario. We'll take the same object. This is always super hard to do. Conditions, yeah, sorry. We'll take the same object and we'll tip it on its side. So the center of mass is still like here, but the normal force can only act, and let's say that there's a force here, the normal force can only act from a place of contact, i.e. the normal force couldn't act here because there's nothing touching there. The normal force has to act from this single point of contact. That's the only place that it could act. So suppose that the normal force, or suppose that the gravitational force and the, the force that I'm applying by like holding it up are perfectly balanced so that the object is in static equilibrium. So it's perfectly balanced. So the downside of this particular setup is that the normal force can't shift to maintain static equilibrium. Like if the, if the magnitude of the force that I was holding it up with changed, the normal force can't like move around to maintain static equilibrium. It, the normal, i.e. the normal force doesn't have room to move. So the question then is what happens if, for example, I decrease F? Like I just stop pushing as hard. So let's think about this. If the object were to stay in static equilibrium, then the normal force would have to move closer to the center of mass, closer to where this force, no, sorry, I, F sub G, where the gravitational force is applied. And the reason for that is because when there are no other external forces, the normal force is supposed to be directly under the, um, 
the center of mass is supposed to be directly under where the gravitational force is applied so that the net torque is still zero. So as I decrease F, the normal force, if it were to maintain static equilibrium, would have to move to the right. It'd have to move closer and closer in. But it can't do that because there's no point of contact. So we would get here that static equilibrium fails. So the conclusion to draw here is that, this is from all of these above examples, is that for any object, if the only acting forces on it are gravity and a normal force, like you just have an object just sitting there, then the object must fall over. It must start rotating. Now fall over in this case means just fall back down to even, but it, it has to tip one way or the other. So long as the normal force cannot possibly be under the gravitational force. <clears throat> so let me uh, just write that over, write that out. So the object, so the implication, objects fall over if and only if the normal force, what just happened? Did I freeze again? I think it froze, but I'm going to keep going. Um, if and only if the normal force um, cannot be under the center of mass. Um, this is assuming there are no external forces or assuming there are no other forces. No other forces. There we go. So if it's just the normal force and gravity, then the object must fall over if and only if the normal force cannot be underneath the gravitational force, which is to say that the base, the base of the object has to be below the center of mass. And so we can actually define stability. We can define what it means for a system to be stable. And so the way that we define stability is we say that the stability of an object is, sorry, not by, um, we define the stability of an object by the angle through which it can rotate. The angle through which we can rotate the object, rotate it such that it returns to its original position. If let go. And I'll draw a picture here. Oh, I really wanted to get to. I might, might go a few minutes over just. All right, so an example. So let me draw a, a picture of a stable example. So let's just say that you have a triangle. You have a triangle, the center, you have F sub G downwards. And if it's just resting on a table, you have the normal force upwards. And importantly, if we rotate that triangle, say um, if we like tip it to the right, F sub G will be downwards here. But now the only point of contact, the only place where the normal force can be applied is on the tip. But the important point is that you could figure out the torque. The torque here is counterclockwise. It would produce, it would produce or the, this normal force would produce a torque that is counterclockwise, right? It, it would curl back around this way. And so that would restore it back to its original position. And you can imagine that you tip the, uh, you tip the triangle over sufficiently far, and it will rotate to a different stable position if you tipped it too far. An example of an unstable equilibrium or an unstable system would be the opposite. You have a triangle that's upside down. So the normal force is straight up. So, so this is technically a stable system, but it's, or this is te technically in equilibrium. Like as long as nothing else happens, it will stay like that. But the moment you tip it just a little bit, then it would fall down because the torque here is clockwise. 
right? The torque, we could, we could figure out, so take a look at the vector. This vector r points from the center of mass to the, to the normal force. You could take that and you could cross it with the, um, need to make sure that I get this right, cross it with the uh, normal force or with, with the normal force. And then you can, um, and so that, that would be into the screen. And so into the screen, it means clockwise rotation. So the object will fall down and not be in its original um, position. Hence, unstable, because even if you just nudge it just a little bit, it'll fall, it'll fall over and leave its original position. Whereas this one would have some degree or some angle that you could tip it by without it going back to it or without it going to a different position after it falls, right? It'll fall back to its original position. Right, so that's the business with stable and unstable um, equilibria, what's happening? And by the way, this is very closely related to the notion of stable and unstable equilibria um, that we talked about before. Consider, for example, um, rather than the x-axis being some position, think of it in terms of an angle. And so you, so in this, in this particular example, you would have theta here and you might have gravitational potential energy here. And so in this case, it would look like this, um, something like this anyway. And so initially it might be starting out in a stable equilibrium. And then if you tip it to the left or right, it'll go back to its stable equilibrium. Whereas in this case, the potential energy to gravity and theta, would, it would be the same formula because it's the same object, but it's in a different initial position. And so if you tip it either way, it'll just fall over to a, to a stable equilibrium. So it's, it's related and you can make this formal if you wanted to. I'm not going to though. All right, so now I'm gonna spend the next probably 10 minutes or so going over steps to solve static equilibrium problems. Now there's a lot of steps and I have an example that I'd like to do, but I'm, I don't know if I'll have enough time. So I'm just gonna go over the steps and if I might run a few minutes over just working out an example that you can see if you're interested and I'll record it as well. So let's talk about steps to solve a static equilibrium problem. And these basically, if you follow these steps, you'll be done. So, or you'll, you'll know how to solve all the problems. So first we want to isolate the object in static equilibrium in a force diagram. So you want to just draw a force diagram for only the object or only the system that is in static equilibrium. Now, sometimes this isn't particularly easy because there can be multiple objects interacting, right? But usually it becomes obvious if your choice of system or if your choice of object is wrong. I.e. sometimes you have to consider a larger system to be the static, to be the, instead of just a single object to be the thing in static equilibrium. But for the most part, it, it'll become obvious if you choose the wrong system. Step two, define a coordinate system, uh, x, y, like x, y axes, um, for the force components, i.e. so that you can say what direction is fx, what direction is fy, and so on, and choose a direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise, cw or ccw, anti-clockwise for those of you who aren't from the Western Hemisphere, um, for positive torque. So basically, we're choosing three things. We're choosing what direction is the x direction, what direction is the y direction, and what direction is positive torque. Now remember, torque is traditionally a vector, but because we're only working in, 2D plane, in, a, in the 2D plane, positive and negative is sufficient because positive, positive torque would correspond to clockwise rotation about that axis in whatever, in, um, whatever coordinate system you choose. And so all you need to do is just choose positive or negative for clockwise or counterclockwise. And it doesn't matter which one, you just gotta be consistent. Step three, extend each force vector. So remember when we talked about the extended force, vector, force lines, that's what we're talking about here. Extend each force vector with a dotted line um, as far as it goes. As it goes on the page, in both directions, just because you're not sure where you'll need to join it with the pivot point. So this is a useful tip, useful. I mean, like, obviously you don't have to do that, but it'll help. Step four, choose a pivot, choose a pivot point, a pivot. Um, and it doesn't matter which one for now. Um, and stick with it for the remainder of the problem. 
i.e. when you're calculating the torque for one force, you have to use the same pivot point as the torque that you calculated for all of the other forces, the same location. Now, just as an aside, not all statics problems, static equilibrium problems, involve hinges or, or things that you might call natural pivot points. Um, that's not what I mean. I, that's not what I mean when I say choose a pivot. I mean just choose a place that you are calling the pivot point about which you are calculating the torque. It doesn't have to be like an actual hinge. It could just be some location on your diagram. You just have to make the choice. Step five, use geometry like trig um, to determine the perpendicular distance or the moment arm to determine the moment arms for each force uh, using the force lines um, for each force. Um, as I mentioned, th that, that is just the perpendicular distance between the pivot point and the extended force lines. So you just find the, uh, the length of the line that connects the pivot point at a right angle to the extended force lines. Step six, multiply. And I know that this is going into super detail, but I know you guys, it, it'll be helpful. Multiply the moment arm, which is just a length now, by the way, just the distance, um, by the magnitude of the force. By the magnitude of the force, of your, and you're going to have to do this for each, each individual force, the force to obtain is, is everything good now? Are, are we good? It is being recorded on my end, and because it's not freezing on my end, uh, you can go back and watch again if you need to. Um, right, multiply the moment arm by the magnitude of the force to obtain the magnitude of the torque for that force. Magnitude of the associated torque. Um, I'm just going to keep going because it's being recorded in time, time crunch. Step seven, determine whether each torque is clockwise. Each torque is clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, and give each torque its corresponding sign. Remember, clockwise or counterclockwise was associated with a sign. If you chose clockwise to be positive, then counterclockwise gets a negative sign. The corresponding sign. Step eight, God, there's a lot of steps. This is kind of the last step. Add up all the torques with their positive and negative bits included, the X components of the, for of the forces, and the Y components of the forces. These are in three separate sums. and set each sum to zero. So then you're, then after you do that, your solution, whatever you're solving for, will be obtained by solving that system of three equations. That's what it'll boil down to. If you have not, like if that's not possible given step eight, like maybe um, then you go back to step four and repeat with a different pivot point. So this is, this, this is all to say, there are some pivot points that are just bad, meaning that they, the thing that you're trying to solve for, they just don't a touch. Maybe, maybe you're trying to solve for like a force that, and you choose a pivot point that makes that force not contribute to the torque and then you can't solve. That will happen occasionally. And so then you just have to go back and choose a different pivot point. But as long as that doesn't happen, you're good. Now, just as a quick aside, and I know I'm, I know I'm out of time, but I want to make sure that I get this out. Um, if you choose a good pivot, sometimes you can get away with not worrying about, for example, the sums of the forces in the x or y direction. All right, so um, those, those are the steps. Now, I really want to work through an example. So I'm going to use um, the next. Um, actually, you know what? What I'm going to do is uh, this example will be in the in the posted notes, but I'm going to end it here and um, 
but I'm more than willing to go over the example in the office hours. So I'm going to end the recording here. Oh boy, it really did freeze, huh? Oh boy. Oh, okay, unfroze. Come on, let me end the recording, please. Just really hope. Okay. Uh, let me just. All right, because that's working. Maybe if I unplug my video, maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll stop freaking out. <laughs>